Good morning and good evening, everyone, because we are hailing from two different jurisdictions. I am Jayanti Jaya, a final year student from National Law University, Odessa, India, and we are joined by Professor Utkarsh Leo from UK. So we are a group of internet regulator enthusiasts in the legal field from India. Today, we would be talking about uh, walking the tightrope protecting data and promoting democracy. Data has become the currency of today's economy and also of the upcoming economy uh, and future. Now, innovation and digitization, automation has become the cause of the day. Artificial intelligence and automation is being introduced in every sector of the world, be it health, be it public services, be it research. So this has increased the importance of data and data protection. Through the course of this session, we would be discussing on as to how we can protect data and promote democracy at the same time. We have two speakers, that is Professor Utkarsh and me, who would be discussing on three essential questions uh, which are significant for today's discourse. The first question is, how can we protect personal sensitive data from state and data harvesters without a symmetric and standardized global approach? The second question would be, how do we define the sphere of personal data? And the third question would be, how can we strike a balance between privacy and promoting innovation in data? The first speaker of this session would be Professor Utkarsh Leo. He is a lecturer in law at the session at the School of Justice, University of Central Lancashire in the United Kingdom. His teaching and research related work addresses law and technology, mediation and dispute resolution, and economics and public policy. He'll be answering the first two questions, which are how can we protect personal sensitive data from state and data harvesters without a symmetric and standardized global approach? And the second question, how do we define the sphere of personal data? The floor is yours, sir. Uh, thanks, Janti. Thanks for the introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening, based upon uh, where you are. Um, right, so... Um, let, let's get started. Firstly, I'm really apologetic that this is happening over a recording, uh, but um, in our defense, we rarely tried to get online. But, you know, at times, um, technology ditches you, and this is one of those instances. Um, okay, so, you know, the world we, we live in today is, um, is more wired than ever. And in fact, this Zoom call is a very good example to say that um, we really live in an increasingly digital world, right? Um, in fact, if I, if I give you some numbers, um, it is estimated that uh, by the end of this year, we'll have produced and consumed um, around 94 zettabytes of data. Um, and 94 zettabytes of data is an astronomical number um, because, um, you know, one zettabyte um, is, one zettabyte equals to about a trillion gigabytes, um, right? And a trillion itself is a huge number because trillion is 10 to the power 12. Um, so, um, so yeah, we, we certainly are creating um, a lot of data uh, in this world. Um, and this is mainly because um, whenever we use the internet from, um, you know, whether it be online surfing to, to shopping to social media, we, we do leave behind uh, a digital footprint, um, either in the form of clicks, likes, views, um, or purchases, right? And, and this makes our online activities and, and devices uh, susceptible to tracking and, and influencing. Um, the best known example um, is uh, the Facebook Cambridge Analytica scandal, um, which happened uh, not so long ago. Right. So uh, I hope you, you get a point as to how this digital data uh, or this digital footprint 
is, is collected, processed, um, and analyzed by corporations uh, and even governments. Uh, corporations, you know, try to monetize this this data by, uh, by 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 going forward for um, you know things like targeted advertisements and and governments uh, governments also have a huge appetite for data um, and uh, data whether it be um, in in the form of biometrics um, or other different identifiers are used um, for uh, state related or state based mass surveillance um, and all of this. Uh, whether it be an encroachment from uh, the side of corporations um, or whether it be the, by the government, um, it certainly creates uh, privacy and uh, data protection issues. And this is why, and this is why um, a data protection law is so important. Because uh, a strong data protection law, something like we have um, in the European Union, um, you know, um, uh, that is the, the GDPR, which um, which sets out, you know, detailed requirements for companies and organizations um, on collecting, storing and, and, and managing personal data, right? So um, this framework um, guarantees tech users in the EU with certain rights, um, including control and access to their data and um, even the right to request uh, that their data be deleted. Uh, so, you know, long story short, um, in, in advanced jurisdictions like, like the EU, uh, we do have uh, better protection. Um, and even competitively, we have a better understanding of personal data, right? Um, contrastingly, if you, if you look at uh, a developing country like India, where certainly informational privacy um, hasn't really been the top priority. Um, in fact, as we stand today, um, India does not have a comprehensive data protection legislation. Um, yes, a fundamental right to privacy was recognized by the Supreme Court in 2017, um, which prompted um, you know, data protection bills um, um, you know, um, for, for discussions. Uh, the best example is the Personal Data Protection Bill 2019, which was proposed. But um, this bill saw at least um, six extensions um, or, you know, the Joint Parliamentary Committee that was trying to discuss uh, this bill um, received at least six extensions at a time when state-based surveillance was at its peak, uh, whether it be you know um, due to the new citizenship amendment laws um, that were brought into picture, um, or uh, the newly developed facial recognition tools um, that were used by uh, the Delhi police uh, to to try to identify protesters uh, who were um, who were you know putting forward their concerns about um, about this new law. So um, I mean. And, and, after all that drama happened, uh, very recently, and more specifically in August 2022, uh, this data protection bill was scrapped, right? Um, and right now, another bill titled the Digital Protection, uh, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill 2022, has been proposed for uh, for public consultation. Uh, and remember, whenever we're speaking of India, um, India has a population of 1.39 billion, right? And our country is is witnessing a digital revolution, uh, but at the same time, uh, we, there is uh, there is rising state surveillance, uh, or uh, there is increased targeted or direct marketing um, from from corporations, and and citizens have little to no protection uh, because there is no comprehensive data protection law, right? And all of this uh, has an impact. On, on democracy. So, uh, I mean, it, one of the most important points uh, that I want to stress upon is that for democracy to thrive, data protection is mandatory. That's the first part, right? And also, um, and I'll, I'll just come down to that in a quick second. And the second point, which I want to stress um, is that even for economic development to happen sustainably, uh, data protection is important. And I'll come down to that once I'm done with, um, you know, how 
how democracy is impacted if data protection um, is, is, is undermined. Um, democracy thrives well uh, when autonomy or uh, something known as, uh, you know, or in fact, when, when citizens have the ability to make an informed, uncoerced decision, um, when this autonomy to make um, informed and uncoerced decisions uh, is available, uh, any democracy uh, operates successfully. And, uh, and as, um, as, as Walker Nobler puts it, uh, autonomy or this very autonomy is impossible without privacy, right? Um, and this is where a personal data protection law, where something, um, you know, a, a safety net protecting citizens personal data from misuse and abuse becomes extremely important because um, it allows um, it allows um, the citizen to make an autonomous decision without um, without being targeted in any form. And any data protection law um, is is built around the principle um, of processing data lawfully, fairly, in a transparent manner, with the purpose of uh, with with purpose limitation and, uh, and and data minimization. Right. So that was the first part. Uh, secondly, I do understand that as we are living in the fourth industrial revolution, big data is a big economic opportunity, right? Uh, but to properly capitalize on this economic, uh, you know, on this economic opportunity also requires data protection, uh, because having effective and efficient data protection laws will help build trust in um, in digital tools. And this trust often translates um, into, you know, greater acceptance of services um, that rely on uh, data sharing and data use, which in a way is good for investment, right? So any form of data usage uh, will, will benefit if we have more trust in the system. And this trust is only possible if we have a data protection law, right? Okay, with that being said, what's fundamentally important is that we cannot think about data protection um, as a national endeavor because data itself um, is, is very fluid, right? Uh, and the problem that I see right now is how jurisdictions um, are trying to address, except the EU. I mean, the EU is quite advanced in terms of data protection, um, but especially developing countries, um, they're all trying to address data protection in, in their own way. So as I see it, the, the world certainly lacks a uniform data protection law, right? Um, and um, so when I say a uniform data protection law, I, I basically mean that there's a need for a global standard that would uh, address the most significant data privacy risks and, um, you know, and, and matters related to protecting individual rights. Um, and at the same time, still allowing a uh, cross-border flow of data worldwide, right? Um, so we need this, this global framework. And I think the United Nations can play a key role um, in doing this, um, you know, both in terms of strengthening national legislative and regulatory frameworks, um, whether it be in collection of processing, retention, um, and um, collection of personal data. Um, and I think uh, one of the best policies that the UN can use right now, in fact, the best treaty, uh, less known or perhaps ign more ignored uh, treaty that the UN can use is, uh, is Convention 108. And I'll come back to that in a moment. <laughs> but long story short, um, as of now, uh, in lax jurisdictions uh, where data protection is, uh, is not strong enough, um, citizens are facing data misuse. And you know, India is no different to this party. Um, also from the business side, uh, because there is no global standard, um, a lack of uniformity, um, is um, is you know um, is a cost element for businesses uh, who are trying to comply uh, of keeping up with the law with the ever changing law uh, and that too from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. So if 
we have a standardized approach. And I know I'm, I'm saying this at a time when, uh, when multilateralism is on its decline, but still I think it's important because standardization and harmonization of data protection laws worldwide will extremely be useful, uh, not just for uh, you know, sustainable development of growth, but also to ensure that um, democracy and, and the rights of people are well recognized. Now, I do understand that the GDPR is certainly a benchmark. Um, it's certainly the best um, and one of the most strictest and, um, um, I mean, that's the best standard whenever you think about data protection law. But for those countries that attempt to comply with GDPR, uh, there are practical hurdles, right? Countries uh, find it challenging to acquire and maintain um, an adequacy decision from the European Commission. I think for Japan, it took almost around two years. So it isn't easy. That is why when I, when I mentioned Convention 108, um, I, I mentioned that for a reason because uh, you know, um, this convention is, 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 a, is a largely ignored data privacy international treaty, right? Um, I, I think um, this, this treaty um, was created by the Council of Europe um, and it's formally known as the Convention for the Protection of Individuals with regards to automatic processing of personal data. Um, recently, it was updated and it is known as uh, Convention 108. Um, and it offers the, you know, the, the possibility to rely on a strong network of peers uh, providing assistance and advice and support. Now, I do understand that simply transposing um, the Convention 108 into national legislation will not be very efficient. So certainly there will be a requirement to tailor national laws um, in accordance with Convention 108 uh, to make sure that uh, data protection is more harmonized. Um, and um, it, it is possible, uh, and it will also face some initial resistance in the form of challenges, and I'll come down to that again in a moment. But um, what's more important is that we understand and we appreciate that in an era of increasing digitalization, it is crucial to allow um, the competent authorities to work, you know, uh, to work together to, uh, to, um, to confront common challenges. And data protection is, is a challenge in an increasingly digital world. So uh, there is one option, which is uh, to forget about privacy and to think that data protection does not really exist especially as the world becomes more digital, or I guess um, we have the option of choosing a more harmonized path where um, data is protected regardless of jurisdiction. Uh, because as I see uh, right now, that in jurisdictions like, um, like the EU, data is well protected, but when you come down to, to certain jurisdictions in Asia or Africa, uh, that level of protection is not there and exploitation of data um, is happening on a daily basis. Lastly, um, my suggestion uh, may sound a bit theoretical, uh, but I guess um, we, we don't have a better option as of now. Um, but yes, of course, uh, there will be challenges in, in, in creating this, this global framework. Uh, some may oppose this as um, you know, accepting um, accepting, um, some may have an acceptance problem because they may take it as liberal European values. Um, some may decline it because um, multilateralism is, is on the decline. However, the most important challenge <coughs> that we face today would be um, in terms of bridging the digital divide. And I guess this is where the UN um, and even the EU and, and the Council of Europe can play an important role in making sure that citizens of both developing nations, um, I mean, as I mentioned, that citizens of advanced um, jurisdictions have a better understanding um, of, of, of consent-based uh, legislations, but it's important that developing countries and the citizens there are made aware about why should they value their data and why shouldn't they just give it away on the drop of a hat, okay? So, um, so that's it. I would have loved to answer a few questions, but, um, this is a recorded session, so can't really do much. Off to uh, you. It, it was uh, very nice listening to you, Professor Utkarsh. So he highlighted on some significant point, which could be stated as he said that protecting data is very important for protecting democracy. And the other important point he made was about Convention 108, which could be a stepping stone 
towards a global data protection uh, data protection treaty. However, it will be very difficult to get everyone on board. Thank you so much, sir. Now, moving on, I would be answering the third question for the session, and that is, how can we strike a balance between privacy and between protecting privacy and promoting innovation in data? Now, a huge amount of data is generated uh, with the increasing digital footprints in the online space. And many big and small companies harvest this data to drive innovation. It is important to promote data and um, data innovation by considering the interests of startups, big or small companies, and uh, through uh, devices like Sandbox. For instance, the earlier data protection bill in India, which was withdrawn, uh, said very little about innovation. It left it to the mercy of policymakers that if they want, they can promote innovation or they can order or they can uh, frame more compliances on these upcoming uh, companies. And this placed a very heavy burden of compliance on the um, small and medium enterprises. A robust compliance system is essential for protecting privacy, but overregulation is detrimental for economy and governments. With increasing the periphery of compliance, the cost also increases. Research shows that increasing the compliance-based system hinders innovation in data, especially. For instance, in India, most of the firms are micro in nature. The ministry report of uh, the uh, Ministry of Micro, uh, Micro, Small and Medium Enterprises in a report says that business, uh, that the number of enterprises uh, of these medium and small, uh, uh, of these medium and small companies are far greater than these big companies and they are 4,000 in number. So it is eventually the small enterprises which are going to bear the brunt of this regulation. For ensuring pri privacy, the uh, um, the bill or the upcoming debates often talk about consent-based system for using data of a data principle. But increasing transparency may make the sharing of data difficult a difficult process, which will be detrimental to the advancement in data technologies and will also somewhere hinder innovation. The consent is often given properly uh, the uh, consent is often not given properly as you know there is a small percentage of population which spends time on understanding the very purpose of collecting data and in reading the terms of agreement especially in india and they also lack the capacity or tools to comprehend these technical tools this balance could be maintained by a strong progressive and evolving law the very aim of data protection laws are to create a balance between in privacy and a free and to give a free flow of information which are often and these two objectives are conflicting in nature free flow of information is important for economy and innovation law may, and this law data protection law can maintain free flow of information and protect privacy at the same time a strong law is required so that it can regulate effectively and for this, governments have to decide whether they have to go for a law which regulates all, all sectors or for sectorial regulations. Law should be progressive enough to allow free flow of information for research and also protect privacy of people. And lastly, the law should be evolving in nature so that it can be amended according to the changes need, changing needs and research, uh, of, uh, research for the society. And now the last thing I would like to say is that people should also be made aware about their rights so that they can make conscious choices and protect their own privacy at the very first instance. So I highlighted on two points that overregulation should be avoided as it is detrimental to innovation and data protection. Um, uh, data protection and data protection laws should be progressive and evolving in nature and every common man should be made aware about their data rights to make a conscious choice and guard their own privacy so since this is a recorded session we will not be opening the floor for questions and we'll be concluding the session here but um, 
you can reach out to us for any question or any discussion which you would like to have in the future to me or to Professor Utkarsh. We'll be mentioning our mail address in the mail which we'll be sending out. And yeah, like, thank you for joining the session. And we hope that you enjoy the content and it is of relevance to IGF 2022. Thank you.